question. Um, so the first talk for this uh, sec second part, well, second session of today, is by uh, Alvise Bastianello, who will tell us about how the dynamics of images locally integrable models. Alvise, for you. Okay. So yeah, thank you very much for organizing the workshop. It's really nice, uh, and I bet it has been quite a nightmare to organize so many talks, so many speakers. So yeah. Uh, let's start. And please, if there are questions, just uh, ask me, interrupt me. Okay. So, something that I very like, I like very much about the thematic workshop is like uh, everybody has been already exposed to the introduction. So more or less, I can skip some basics of integrability, GHD, and so on. Okay. What are the topics of today? I want to show you how is it possible to include some uh, in the hydrodynamic. Uh, uh, framework some inhomogeneities in the dynamics. We have already seen in the previous. So, so I'm speaking. Sorry, I'm in a guest office. So, uh, I already you have already seen as impossible to describe, for example, inhomogeneities like traps and so on. No? But actually, it can be much more general. And you can play with more or less arbitrary uh, couplings that uh, locally conserve the integrability of the model. Okay. And in the second part of the talk, I want to show you something about, uh, well, let's say, a problem that uh, uh, escaped the first uh, smooth picture. Indeed, there can be some inhomogeneities that apparently look like uh, to be smooth, but they are not. In this case, you should supplement uh, GHD with uh, further consideration in order to gain, again, uh, protect, protective power. Okay? But let's start with uh, the situation where everything goes uh, smoothly. So, what I will tell you is quite general, but for the sake of a concreteness, I want to focus on a very specific model, for example, Liebling. Now, in this model, in the homogeneous case, there are some parameters that we can change retaining the integrability of the system. Of course, we can change the chemical potential, but we can also change the interaction. Okay? And for every valid interaction, the system is integrable. Now, physically, changing the external potential the, sorry, the chemical potential just amounts to change the uh, longi longitudinal trap of the system. But you can also imagine acting on the uh, interaction, just squeezing the system. Of course, uh, if you squeeze the transverse direction, you're increasing the uh, effective interaction on this uh, the other one in the system. Okay? So I would like to approach the problem of uh, describing the system when we start having some smooth homogeneities in U and C. And of course, I want to do it with generalized dynamics. Now, this I promise that is the only uh, general slide, uh, introductory, introduction slide on generalized dynamics. Okay? So the idea of the game is uh, always the same. You have some smooth homogeneities, so you can uh, uh, invoke local relaxation to the local uh, stationary state of the homogeneous system. And since we're integrable, the stationary state is a GG, and you are left out with the problem of gluing together GGs at different points in space and time. Okay? This is actually the technically hard part. And uh, what you gain, uh, what you obtain after these uh, um, considerations are GHD equations. Okay? Here I'm neglecting uh, diffusive corrections, I just want to, uh, to stay at the Eulian scale. In, um, in this equation, we have the filling, my notation about theta. The previous talk has been like n several times. That is a function of space and time because we want to be homogeneous and of another uh, variable called rapidity or quasi momentum, lambda in my notation. Okay? In general, um, this equation describes uh, particles flowing around the system. For example, you see that there is a uh, velocity effective velocity coupled to a special derivative and just describes you how particles are moving in space but then there can be also other terms affecting forces coupled to translation in the rapidity space indeed the translation and rapidity space are just changing the quasi momentum of the particles and of course changes in quasi momenta are associated with forces this is the general form and of course we're gonna extensively discuss the force terms so um, let me start with, uh, um, I want to give you a flavor, it's possible to derive this kind of GHD equation, how they uh, can be obtained. Let me focus on a very simple situation where I'm uh, fully homogeneous in space and I just look at uh, 
uh, inhomogeneous in time. Since I've been minded vinegar, let me just change slowly in time the interaction in the polymer. But of course, you can play with more general situations. So these are um, given curves for the evolution, for the change in the coupling. But uh, in order to approach the problem, it's very instructive to split it in a sequence of small branches. Instead of smooth evolution, I just uh, uh, look at sequence in data small branches. So I'm changing the coupling delta C, waiting for the time delta T, so on and so forth. And of course, the full, the full problem just amounts to solve the infinitesimal quench and repeat the solution. And of course, I want to limit those low changes. So I can more or less assume delta P to be very, very large compared with some microscopic scale of the system. So let me solve the small quench. I start from an initial state that I can assume to be a GG. And I want to stress that it is a GG at a given value of the coupling C. Indeed, since we are changing the coupling, we are also changing the integral models we are, model we are referring to because it's coupling dependent. So I just excite the system. I wait for a delta T time that's supposed to be long enough, enough to get a relaxation to the new GG. And of course, a new GG now is computed on the model of C plus delta C, so different integral model. And you are left out with the problem of doing together these two, two GGs. How you can do that? Well, if you look uh, in the holy book of branches, you will uh, do what you have, have been told to be to do, like uh, looking at uh, the expectation value of the charges. So what I'm doing here, simply, I'm imposing that uh, the uh, expectation value of the charges of the post quench theory, so computed as C plus delta C, is equal in the final state or the initial state. Now, the right, right hand side is simple because it's just uh, the expectation value of a charge computed on a GG of MS. Instead, the left hand side member is not simple at all. And in general, for arbitrary delta C, it's not solvable. But we just need the small delta C because the quench is infinitesimal. And uh, well, you can guess that if you start tailoring expanding this guy, what we are need to compute in the end is just the derivative of the charge, arbitrary charges actually, which is to the coupling on the GG. And uh, the, the turning point of the computation, like uh, this guy can be exactly computed using a generalization, the hellman feynman theorem. The hellman feynman theorem just tells you how to compute the um, derivative which is to a coupling of the Hamiltonian. And it just uses that uh, the Hamiltonian is a concept charge. And I can play exactly the same trick with arbitrary concept charge. So this guy here, this uh, delta C of Tj, is computable for arbitrary values of the charges. And if you do that, you impose the um, conservation of the charge expectation value for arbitrary charges, and you put into the game also special homogeneities, harder task, that's doable, you find this kind of generalized hydrodynamics uh, equation. Okay? Well, of course, you have a, a false term, but also some uh, the lost term, sorry, but also some false terms that actually are organized in two different terms. One coupled to uh, time inhomogeneities and change our parameter in time and this in this and false, but also to spatial homogeneities. And they are like uh, uh, two separate contributions. And again, uh, these two forces can be uh, divided, categorized in two different terms. Indeed, we have some single particle effects. And these are just due to the fact that uh, if you start changing the dispersion law the single particle because you are changing the coupling, of course you accept some force on the excitation. And this single particle effect that you get, for example, if you want to study enabling inhomogeneous terms. However, in addition, we have also other terms that are collective effects. Indeed, you can see that they are collective because of their explicitly proportional to the film. So they depend on the presence of the other particles. And uh, these terms are there only if you are changing the scattering data of the theory, the uh, scattering phase theta. Indeed, for example, if you look at the Bringer, you want to change the interaction, for example, you want to increase the repulsion, of course, the particle will be accelerated because they repel more. And this, this must be contained in the GH definition. And this term exactly does the job. Now, setting aside the uh, possible uh, checks 
I just want to flash some possible applications. For example, now we can start the uh, slow uh, induction function the linear model in a trap. Okay, we can follow with GHC the behavior of the of the um, of the filling, and of course also compute the observables for which we have uh, um, exact expressions. For example, in this case is simply the density. Okay. Now, in order to move to the second part, I want to make a, a very trivial observation at this point, but uh, whose consequences are not trivial. Let me consider now the GHD equation in the homogeneous case in space, okay, but with some inhomogeneous in homogeneity in time. Okay? So I adopt the spatial derivative and have just these simple GHD equations with alpha some uh, coupling that I'm changing. Now, trivial as it is, I can absorb the time dependence parameterizing the, the equation directly with uh, the coupling. Okay? And if you do so, you obtain some equations that are completely time independent. In the sense, they do not have any explicit time dependence. What does it mean? It means that uh, this equation is describing some uh, reversible protocol because there is no any explicit information on time. For example, if I start uh, from initial G, I start changing the coupling somehow to some value and I go back, every time I go back to the same value in the initial cap of the interaction, I'm also back to the initial state. Now, for example, if you have in mind uh, um, a system, a uh, thermodynamic large system, you have the ground state, and the ground state is get, uh, you can, for example, use uh, the adiabatic theorem. In this case, uh, you are changing a parameter, you follow the ground state, okay? So you can go back to a certain value and go back. And of course, you'll be again in the ground state. But in this case, uh, this holds true also for a uh, get situation, okay? And this just do because uh, you are not only, uh, you do not have only the uh, Hamiltonian, but infinite many uh, charges. And so if there is not a gap in the Hamiltonian, there are gaps in the other charges somehow. Okay? This is the physical interpretation. However, you can also ask, uh, uh, is it always the case? And as you can guess, if I'm posing this question, the answer is no. And this um, moved me to the second part in which I want to discuss this specific example of a flux quench in the XRZ spin chain. Okay, let me comment a bit on the system. So we have our favorite integrable spin chain. Okay, this object is integrable for arbitrary values, the magnetic field D, and of the interaction delta. In addition, I put another parameter, capital C, in this notation, that has the meaning of being a magnetic flux piercing the spin chain, okay? And what I want to do is to make this flux a dynamical variable, and start changing it in time and see what happens, okay? Now, probably, I'm sure that you are familiar with the XRZ spin chain. Maybe you are not so familiar with the spin chain in the presence of the flux, and the reason is uh, trivial, in the sense that uh, the Hamiltonian at a given value of the flux is actually uh, completely equivalent to the Hamiltonian in the absence of the flux. The two are connected by unitary transformation. So as long as you want to study thermodynamics, correlation functions, changing delta of B, you can be at arbitrary values of the flux and the field is, is always the same. But of course in this case, since we are changing the value of the flux in time, we have to keep the full Hamiltonian, the free parameter of the flux. Okay? Now, if you focus on the reversibility or lack of it of this uh, process, you find a uh, quite interesting phase diagram in the slide. So here, it strongly depends on the value of the interaction delta. Indeed, if delta is larger than one, you are exactly in the situation that I was discussing in the previous slide. Fully reversibility of the protocol. A change of flux, also to some value, go back, and then back to the same interest. Instead, if you're looking at a situation where delta is smaller than one, okay, in absolute value, of course, this is what matters in the model, you find that uh, the system lacks reversibility, and in addition, you get some entropy. That, of course, you don't have uh, in the reverse market. Okay? And uh, in the many part of the talk, uh, I want to show, to try to explain uh, why this difference and to explain uh, uh, how we can still be predictive. Okay? So, uh, 
let me present you a crash course in the TDL Dex at Zid. Okay. Now, in this situation, uh, in this protocol, you can still write down some GHD equation. Well, here, I'm just the magnetization of each string. Because in this case, uh, different from the Liebling, we do not have only a single, um, a single kind of uh, species of excitation, but several of them. And actually, the number is uh, strongly dependent on the value of that. For that larger than one case, you have infinite many strings that can be actually interpreted as bound state of elementary excitation described by the first string. In the data is more than one case, instead, the number is finite and depends on that. But this is not the critical difference between the two situations. I want to draw your attention on the fact that uh, for data larger than one case, you actually have that the rapidities live uh, in a building zone. Now, the rapidities are just a parameterization of the momentum. You should actually look uh, at uh, the momentum as a function of the rapidity. You will discover that if you move the rapidity within, uh, I can see the point. If you move the rapidity within the definition domain, uh, the momentum associated will cover the whole building zone. That is more than one, of course, you analyze this, so you still have uh, a building zone in terms of the momentum. But what we discover is like if you look at the momentum as a function of the rapidity and you move the rapidity in the definition of the domain, the momentum will not cover the whole building zone. So why for that as much larger than why you can actually interpret this as a building zone for the rapidities, this is not a building zone for the rapidities. Okay? This would be the crucial difference to explain the two different interpretations. Okay? So question, where does the entropy production come from? Because in the end, the GHD equation we wrote are exactly as those of the previous slides. However, if you want to solve a differential equation, you need the differential equation, but also proper boundary conditions. And the trick here, what really matter, matters is the different boundary condition you have to put at the boundaries of the definition of the rapidity space. Okay? So let me start first with a situation where everything goes smoothly. So that's larger than one. Um, in this case, uh, as I told you, I have a building zone. And uh, let me try to explain what happens with a uh, cutting picture. Of course, I'm in a thermodynamic limit, so I have feelings. Uh, I'm describing an uh, infinite uh, thermodynamic large number of particles. But let me play with these uh, particles that are set on the defense strings. Okay? In principle, I have infinite many of them, but uh, drawing infinite many strings on a slide is harder. So just for now. Now I start changing the flux, okay? I increase the flux, and this from the GT equation means that I'm exerting some force. In the rapidity space, it means that I'm just moving the particles in the rapidity space. In this case, if I increase the flux, I make it larger, all the particles go in the same direction toward the right, okay? But now at a certain point, you'll be in a situation where you keep on increasing the flux, and at a certain point, one the particle reaches the boundaries, okay? And of course, you would like to keep on translating it. Uh, how can you do that? Well, in this case, the solution is simple because we have a building zone. What you have to do is just uh, continue the translation from minus by half and keep on going, okay? And of course, uh, these kind of boundary equations, boundary conditions are fully reversible. If you are back to minus by half and then you go back, you know exactly where you have to go. So in this case, you have some time-reversible GHD equation, time-reversible boundary condition, and fully time-reversible dynamics of the whole problem, okay? okay? Let me now instead look at the case uh, where something goes wrong. So uh, let me focus on delta small than one, and delta equal to one half for simplicity. In this case, we have three strings. For other values of delta, the number of strings is different. The situation is slightly more complicated, but uh, the same picture holds okay? So yeah, in, this, in this case, I want to play the same game. So I start changing the flux, let me increase it, and the particles will accelerate. Now, in this case, they accelerate in this way. The first two strings on the right, the third on the left. Just because uh, this is the way in which the strings parameterize the momentum, actually, okay? Um, the strings are indeed like a, just a simple parameterization. But now again, you are finding a certain situation where you are keep on translating particles and one of them reaches the boundaries. But now it's not so clear how you can continue this translation because you do not have a balloons on any 
from there. So what can you do? Mm -hmm. Well, you will uh, learn a lot uh, if you look at the charge again values at the boundaries of the uh, rapidity definition for me. Instead, if you look at it, uh, you discover this, uh, uh, this relation that uh, if I take uh, for a given charge on a given string and uh, send the rapidity, let's say, to infinite, you get this something that is proportional to the same charge on the first string. And the proportionality is just the magnetization. The magnetization just tells you the number of elementary components that are forming the excitation on the sky by the string J. Okay? So what, what is it happening? From the point of view of the charges, uh, the strings uh, just at the boundaries, the repeated definition, plus infinite or minus infinite, are completely indistinguishable. You cannot really distinguish any longer with the charges if you have a bound state of n particles or n free particles. Now, this could be a little bit uh, fishy, maybe, because we are told that uh, the charges can um, unequally fix uh, the population of the strings. And actually, this is true for the thermodynamic case, because when you do thermodynamics, a single point at plus infinity or minus infinity is just a measure zero. It doesn't really matter for thermodynamics. Okay? So effectively, the charges uh, completely fixed uh, the, the thermal state and possible correlation function. However, in this case, uh, we are forcing all the particles to move through, to move through this uh, uh, zero measure point. But in this case, because the dynamics uh, starts to matter. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, from the point of view of the charges, we cannot tell apart the strings. And so, uh, with the idea just that we can uh, move the particle from one string to another one and keep on uh, with uh, the evolution. Okay? And now we have uh, several different uh, interesting possibilities. For example, we can have a well, trivial process. We have uh, a particle for the first string, let's say, that is just a uh, uh, Element excitation that jumps to the third string. That's still describing just element excitation. However, you can also be in a situation where a molecular, a two particle bound state, jumps to another string that doesn't support bound state any longer. Okay? So you have a break in a bound state. But even more intensely, you'll be in a situation where you are forming a bound state. For example, imagine that I have two particles here on the third string, two element excitation, sorry, in the third string. And they can proceed with the evolution according to this arrow, either to the second or to the first string. Both of the situations are equally possible from the point of view of the strings, but of course, if uh, well, physics in this case would like to be deterministic, and we have to understand which is the combination rate and how to fix it. And this can be told by the charges on. So let me approach this problem. What is GG? GG is just charge conservation and entropy maximization. And we actually have already looked at the charges. We already fixed that. So the only ingredient we are left with is entropy maximization. Actually, to be honest, in this case, uh, the right uh, ingredient is not really the entropy itself, but uh, its rate under the proxy evolution. Let me consider now the younger, younger entropy, this object here. This is just a definition of the function eta. Usually, this guy is uh, conserved uh, with the, under the generalized dynamics equation. You can just compute the time derivative or flux derivative, in this case, of the entropy, insert the GHD equation, and find that it is zero. However, doing that, uh, we are doing some integration by parts. There are some boundary terms that usually they do not matter, but in this case, they matter. And indeed, if you compute the um, the change of the entropy under the flux change, you'll find two different contributions that are not necessarily zero. One associated only with quantities at repeat minus infinity, another one with quantities with repeat plus infinity. These are boundary terms. And so now you can just ask for charge conservation and impose that you are maximizing the entropy rate production. And this gives you some completely deterministic way to fix how to recombine the bound states. So you can uh, keep on uh, uh, evolving the system and having to get a GHD equation plus these boundary conditions. Let me see how it works. Now, in this case, uh, 
we are comparing uh, the GT equation, the four lines, with uh, dashed lines are accepted organizations. The crosses are TDDP algorithm uh, simulations. Okay. And uh, here we are changing the flux from 0 to 2 pi and on different time scales. That is this capital T. Of course, larger T is slower we are proceeding. We are starting from the ground state uh, with a finite magnetization. Okay. So the initial state is just a Fermi C on the first string. And then we are up um, increasing the flux. And here, first column, delta equal to one alpha, uh, to, sorry, to partial 1.5, that is larger than one. And here, second column, third column, delta equal to one alpha with different values in the initial magnetization. First row, uh, the energy, second row, the current, uh, the spin current. Now, delta larger than one, everything goes very, very simple. Just to remind you, delta larger than one is a case where everything goes uh, fine. You need, uh, you see all the curves one on top of the other. Instead, uh, in the delta uh, equal to one half case, uh, still, this GHT seems to uh, predict reasonably well what's happening, but uh, the convergence is much slower. And uh, in order to understand this, uh, let me fix, uh, uh, let me focus on this plot and the spin Here you see that uh, the um, GHD equation predicts some non anticipated point. Here there is a sudden jump. Actually, there is this point also in uh, the plot of the energy, just less evident, and also in the other plots. Now, of course, uh, the microscopic evolution itself is fully smooth. smooth. So, in order to reproduce uh, something that is non anticipated, you have to zoom out a lot. Okay? So, this is why we are uh, experiencing this very, very large T in order to start approaching the GT prediction. Now you can uh, ask uh, what uh, what is what what this analysis point is. Well, and uh, it is exactly when the feeling that is moving the first finger under the flux uh, under the force uh, induced by the flux uh, is when this feeling hits uh, for the first time uh, the boundary of the uh, repeated domain. And so is where this uh, non-trivial uh, boundary condition uh, Start, uh, started to, to be important. And guess what? If you look now at the entanglement entropy of the system, this half, uh, uh, the entanglement of half of a chain, you see this behavior. For bias the flux where the Fermi C is not uh, uh, touching the boundaries, so we are still in the, let's say, user GHD with no entropy production, the entropy is just uh, flat. Okay, so the, this is actually the entropy uh, the entropy minus the entropy initial state. And then suddenly, when you hit this boundaries, the entanglement entropy is growing. Just because uh, as soon as uh, uh, the young, young entropy is not uh, uh, zero any longer, you can accommodate for actually a uh, uh, thermodynamic large entanglement of uh, half the chain. So this is just a. Uh, sorry, I'm completing me. I always miss the point. So this entropy is just growing signaling that you are actually producing entropy. Okay. So yes, let me jump to the so, so so can I uh, can I ask? Yes. So so, uh, um, so in, in, in this um, protocol I, I still I, I don't see whether there is a explicit time dependence on the variation on the sorry on the uh, GHD equations. So before you show that there was no explicit time dependence there is not because I've solved it. Me yeah, but then I find it a bit strange because I, I could do the same protocol saying the time of the universe and approaching an adiabatic. Uh, so you can do what? Sorry. Can you repeat, so I find a bit strange that also here you don't have an explicit time dependence because I then I could do the same protocol in the time of the universe. So approaching adiabatic process. And in that case, I shouldn't find an increase of the entropy. Whereas since your protocol does not depend explicitly on time, you would predict still uh, in any case an increase of the entropy. So I, I, I understand why in the previous case there was no uh, increase in the entropy, indeed it was reversible. But now I, I find a bit incompatible the fact that you, you, you have an increase of the entropy and also uh, equations that are, uh, do not ex depend explicitly on time. Wait, wait, wait. The fact is that uh, the, uh, we do not have, uh, um, okay, the equations itself are not uh, explicit and dependent, okay? They're just, uh, you can parameterize them in terms of the flux changes, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the fact is that uh, 
Okay, in this case, uh, delta OGN1, no entropy production in the sense that a young, young entropy should tell you uh, the uh, saturation, the entanglement of a given interval, say, is always the same. You're not changing that. But here, this point here, we have, uh, uh, sorry, for delta OGN1, there's more than one. We have the time evolution up to, let's say, where the dashed line is placed is still reversible in the sense that the filling is not touching the boundaries. So the part of the maximization entropy doesn't take place. Then at a certain point, you hit these boundaries. And what does it happen? Even though you just hit a little bit with an infinitesimal uh, change of the flux. Yeah, this is uh, what I, I find it very strange that even infinitesimal and, and infinitesimal. No, that, 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 that's a trick. Oh. Because, uh, if I will look at a finite interval, finite interval, the, the entropy will you saturate the young young entity. That is, let's say, infinitesimal, just the field. No, but, no, but I mean, physically, so you, you're changing with an infinitesimally small quench for infinitesimally um, window parameters. So, I mean, this is why I think it's strange that you can still have entropy production, but, uh, even though I'm allowed to do this infinitesimally slow. But, because, uh, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but then once you hit this point of, of, of uh, yes. uh, theta, then, I mean, so once again, so it seems that as soon as I do delta uh, phi. Right. So here, yeah. for example, this is the entanglement entropy of half of a chain that is infinite in this case. So even a small quench, infinitesimal, will end up in a, uh, just in the growth of the entanglement entropy because it's, it's not saturating, it's not a finite system. So it just keeps on growing. Right. right. But, so, so, I mean, imagine, okay, so just, and then I will close, but imagine that I give you a, a finite window of, 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 of the variation for the angle phi. So I say, I want to vary a phi from zero to uh, pi uh, in, in this protocol. And then imagine you repeat the same uh, variation scheme for times that it's first one microsecond, then 10 seconds, then the age of the universe. And then you, you're telling me that it doesn't matter how long that it, it takes, it will always produce. Of, of course, if you look at it here, <coughs> These are curves for different times, okay? We scaled uh, on the same value of the thing. So of course, if I do it slowly, the, the entanglement entropy is larger, it's growing more. But just because, because in this case, uh, I look at the entanglement entropy of out of the system that is infinite, so the saturation point is actually infinite. If, would, uh, if I would look at uh, entanglement entropy or finite interval with the rest of the chain, okay? You're gonna see a uh, saturation to some point uh, then that point is, uh, say, delta phi closer to the initial value. Okay. Maybe I can just, okay, maybe just, we can just a like, quick yeah, comment. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Just uh, what I resisted. So I think there's another time scale which has to do with the thermodynamic limit of the system, and that's the time scale below which you would have adiabatic transformation. You know, this is what I've been. Uh, this is, this is, yeah, this is what you started. Uh, well, in this case, for the entanglement, just uh, I have to. What I can control with a young, young entropy is S over L, L size of the system. That is thermodynamic larger, is infinite in this case, because L is alpha of the system. So, uh, of course, it keeps growing with time. And if I wait for more time, it's going more, just because the saturation point that should be richer is infinite, because there is an L in front of it. Okay, the story will be different if I look at the final system. Yeah. I would say that this is more, okay, well, well, this you. is a picture okay. I didn't mind. We, we can discuss later, but yeah, thank you. Yes, yes, uh, whenever you wish. Um, so, other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Can I ask you a question? Yes, for sure. Oh, it's about XXZ. In XXZ, you have this flux, phi, and um, there is a special situation when I consider zero temperature, B, your magnetic field, B equal to zero, mm -hmm. and also delta smaller than one. Then, uh, um, this, um, there is a special process when phi, this twist, the, your capital phi, uh, changes from zero to four pi, like double period, uh, zero to four pi. And then there's some very delicate um, coherent uh, phenomena happen. I mean, the ground state, if I do this adiabatically in time, change your phi from zero to four pi, then the ground state first go up with time, but then it goes down after four pi, it goes exactly back down to the ground state. And then uh, maybe I just send, uh, I send through the chat the reference to the paper where all of this is described. 
And then I would expect that in this special situation, the entropy production will be lower because it looks like coherent to me. Maybe you can have a look at the paper and later when you will have time, maybe you can uh, reply. Yes, yes, sir. I'm just trying to picture out uh, the chat. It is in the chat. My name is Vladimir Korypin, and I sent it through the chat. I guess I sent it to everyone, actually. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I will, I will definitely look at it and would like to discuss more. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. And so let me conclude. Then maybe there could be other questions, but I want just to flash the last slide. Okay. So summary. I told you how it's possible to include some inhomogeneities in the dynamics of the integral model as well, as long as they locally expect uh, respect the integral B to the model. And then uh, I pointed out a situation where something that is actually smooth in a parameter is not smooth in the dynamics, in the sense that you escape the user GHD situation. Okay. Now, what is in my shopping list for the future? Actually, I would really like to have a general understanding how it's possible to play with a uh, uh, homogeneous integral model that uh, uh, where the homogeneities cannot be smooth. For example, uh, imagine that uh, I'm uh, changing some uh, interaction uh, integral model. Even though the parameter changes smoothly, it can be that the response of the system to this change is not smooth at all. For example, in Lieblinger, if you start changing interaction from a passive to attractive, for example, C larger than zero, you just have one single uh, particle species. C smaller than zero, you have in instead infinite many bound states. Okay? So no matter how slow you are moving from C positive to C negative, you always uh, uh, cross a point uh, where the system is not uh, responding as much pressure. Okay, and well, the being is a situation, but uh, if you this well, this is really in the far future because it's difficult. But for example, the sine Gordon model that is implemented in the experiment of Vienna, because of the intrinsic homogeneities of the trap is an uh, inhomogeneous sine Gordon model as well. And in sine Gordon, the particle content, the excitation content really depends on the cap in the system. And so I think it is a primary interest to be able to control uh, this framework with uh, inhomogeneous uh, integral model with, yeah, homogeneous interactions. And uh, so, yeah, this is actually a work in progress and uh, we should have some uh, results soon for the video at least. So, yeah. Thank you for uh, attending my talk, and of course, thank you for my collaborators in this project. And if there are other questions, but I think that maybe I'll be too late. Thank you. Thank you, Elvise, for this very nice talk. Um, yeah, I mean, if there are other uh, quick questions, there were already some questions. I have, I don't, I have one, one very quick question. I mean, uh, that's about entropy production. I mean, if you look at ordinary hydrodynamics, entropy produ is produced whenever the system develops a shock. Yes. And that's on the Euler scale. And so I just wonder whether there's some analogy, you know, with your entropy reduction and the entropy, you know, coming from the shock. Well, uh, I would really like now to have uh, the slides of my old talks, but there is some sort of shock. Uh, imagine that uh, I'm plotting the feeling, okay? The feeling, first thing is just this from C and this approach in the boundary, and then I continue somehow. And you find that, uh, for example, if you start from the ground state, the feeling is as 8, 1, and you hit uh, the string, then the feeling that is continuing the other string, because of the different uh, forces experiencing, is not uh, actually 1 anymore, but it's smaller. So there's a sort of jump uh, if you try to put together the two feelings. I do not know if this is uh, directly related to your question, but it is the most evident kind of shock I can imagine this protocol. Yeah, maybe I make an additional comment on that. So in, in GHD, usually one says that there are no shocks that develop. I mean, there's no sustained entropy production. Contrary to standard hydro, that, like Herbert says, you, usually you have shock developing where there's sustained entropy production. But, uh, so while your, your, the phenomenon, phenomenon that you're mentioning seems to be producing a large amount of entropy, so that's yeah. a bit different from yeah, so that would be nice to investigate a bit more. In this it case, means. it's difficult to understand what a shock is because I'm not in homogeneous in space, just in time. Yes, yes, so I, I understand. Have, like the thing with a uh, shock in space that is like a straight line. And, uh, but this one is a shock in rapidity space, which is uh, what happens always in GHD. So, 
No, but uh, you need like uh, you said to have a shock. Uh, you want to write down uh, rapidity and uh, space. Uh, you have this yeah. plot, uh, and it looks like a straight line. Uh, let's say, if I uh, plot the profile as a function of the rapidity, I always see a shock. Uh, it is continuous. Yeah, continuing. but these are not shocks. This is a bit different. Exactly. So I mean, uh, but this looks exactly like that to me. But here there's entropy production, so there's a bit. Uh, 